Hey everybody, this is Greg Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Pedixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Psychoanalysis, number one through four, published by EC Comics in 1955. These uh, are the reprints that uh, Gemstone Publishing did in the 90s. Really great reprints. They uh, basically succeeded in reprinting almost every EC comic. And I have almost all of them. I'm still missing like five. For like 25 years, I've been trying to find these elusive five EC comics. But I do have all the psychoanalysis. <laughs> I can't do the plural of that. So... Um, I have all four issues, and I'm, we're going to look at them today. This comic blows my mind that this was uh, an idea from EC in 1955 that they would uh, think to make a comic about psychoanalysis. And you can tell even by the covers just how I can't even imagine little kids picking this up off the stands. Uh, look at these covers. They're just very mundane because these are very talky comics. They're just lots of dialogue. These could easily be adapted into a, like a teleplay. Um, not a lot of, no action at all. People just talking. Even the tagline is uh, so mundane. People searching for peace of mind through psychoanalysis. These almost look like to me like an R. Sequoiaq parody because it has the typical EC uh, layout for the covers. But instead of the vault keeper and the crypt keeper and the old witch. They have Freddie Carter, Ellen Lyman, Mark Stone, just three average schmoes, you know? So very interesting that they did this. But um, the strange thing about it is these are amazingly adult comics. Not that they have nudity or vi incredible violence. They're uh, the only people who could like these comics are adults. There's uh, nothing here for children that would interest them. So kind of fascinating that in 55, they were trying to do this. Um, these were uh, came out from EC's New Direction. Uh, that was a line of titles that EC started after they basically had a shit can almost all their titles after the Comics Code Authority came out. Um, they were either too gory or too violent. And um, so they try to clean up, clean up their act. And they put out a line of titles that were nice and clean but man, this is really interesting that they went in this direction. I guess that um, William Gaines and Al Feldstein were both interested and um, patients of psychoanalysis. So in the 50s, it wasn't a big thing. It wasn't like this universal thing where people went to therapy. It's pretty much a thing for big city people. It was still seen as a, a there was a stigma to go to see a therapist. So this is a really daring comic of its time. And I got to say, it's surprising how entertaining these are. These comics I found riveting, even though they shouldn't be. The The art is, you know, nothing's happening because it's a, a therapy session. Well, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned real quick. This is a Jack Kamen cover. And unlike most EC comics, this is all the same artist. Jack Kamen draws every comic in these. So it's a one-man anthology, basically. Of course, except for the writers. So we have a little introduction. This is the psychiatrist. Into his peaceful, tastefully decorated, subdued office come the tormented and the driven, seeking to unravel the tangled emotional skeins that cloud and knot their broken lives. I don't think we ever find out this guy's name. He's just the psychiatrist. Here's a little intro page. And, uh, I mean, can you picture a little kid picturing this up and being like, oh, yeah, this seems rad. I'm buying this comic. It's very subdued. So we have case number 101, Freddy Carter, session number one. And as we see, it has a very interesting format. There's three stories per issue. It's a session of three different patients. And they continue, just as therapy isn't just this like one and done thing. We continue in every issue when we see the progress of these people and the things they learn about themselves. So this first story is Freddie Carter, he's a 15 year old boy, is brought in. His parents are um, just like, ah, oh, he just stole a watch. They're just, they're pissed off at him. 
And like, we're at the end of our rope. This is the only thing we could do. We figure maybe he needs a therapist. The psychiatrist pr pretty soon realizes that it's the parent's fault. They're bickering. They both have different ideas of what their son should be. They're kind of tearing him in two different directions. Um, they don't want him to just be happy. They want him to be what they want him to be, to um, a little uh, model of what they think a 15-year-old should do with his life. Yeah, and so the psychiatrist is basically like, okay, guys, I'm talking to Freddie alone. You're, I can tell already you're the problem. You know, there's no wonder this kid's fucked up. So uh, Freddie and him have his first session. And uh, he asked him, he says, why did you steal the watch, Freddie? And basically it was this thing where his friend, who he stole the watch from, he has a nice family. His mom and dad don't push him. They don't uh, browbeat him. And the kid's happy. So it was part of it is like he stole the watch because he, you know, wanted to steal his happiness. He was resentful of his friend. He was jealous. So he makes a breakthrough and uh, he realizes that his mother wants him to be, as the father would say, she, the father's like, his mother's turning him into a sissy. She's introducing him to art and music and that sissy stuff. And the father just wants him to do sports and get good grades in like science and math so he can be an engineer just like he is, follow in his footsteps. So we have a breakthrough where the psychiatrist tells Freddie that uh, sports are in sissy. I'm sorry, uh, art and music is in sissy-ish. So you can like it if you want to. We have uh, the next case, case number 102, session one, Ellen Lyman. And this woman's messed up. So she goes to see the psychiatrist and they do a little dream therapy. She, uh, she tells her, he, she tells him about this weird recurring nightmare she has. And this is the most interesting that it's ever going to get in this comic. Every now and then they do a dream sequence. But other than that, it's panel after panel of face shots and close-ups and people talking because that's the meat of the, the plot. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm still getting over my cold. So what we find out in this first session is that she's incredibly envious of her older sister. Her older sister was prettier and smarter and the parents seemed to love her more. And after she was born, Ellen, the parents... Uh, financial fortunes kind of dropped. So she didn't get the same good toys that her older sister got. So she has this amazing insecurity and he finds out from the dream. He uh, figures out that that's what the dream is about. And he gets her to admit that she kind of resents her sister. And in the dream almost wants her to die. So they, that's their little breakthrough for the session. So I haven't mentioned yet that those first two stories were written by Daniel Keyes, the guy who went on to write Flowers for Algernon, that famous science fiction story. But at the time, he was working for EC, and he writes all of the the Freddie Carter... Is that his name? Sorry. Yeah, Freddie Carter and Ellen Lyman stories are written by Daniel Keyes, and they're like the first two stories every issue. Here we have a little ad for The New Direction. These are really great comics. The um, They have little, like, articles in each one, like every EC Comics did. Usually they were short stories, but this one is, like, little facts and trivia about psychology and dream research and stuff like that. So now we have our third patient, Mark Stone. And he's this guy who's got a, he's got a weight problem. But he's a pretty successful writer. But he's, he's been having panic attacks, just like Tony Soprano. He thinks they're heart attacks can't breathe, his heart feels like it's stopping, but they're anxiety attacks. And we find out that, uh, you know, he has this dream of being a real writer, not just writing for the paycheck, writing his real thoughts and feelings like a writer should. But he's totally conflicted. And um, 
we also find out that he's kind of an asshole. He's uh, very full of himself. And um, he gets angry and jealous if he goes to see a movie where the writing's great. Because he's like, I, want, I should be doing that. So we find out that as a youth, he grew up, uh, he was Jewish. And in this town he grew up and he was persecuted. Kids threw rocks at him, made fun of him. And uh, so he has this uh, insecurity because he changes his name to Mark Stone, you know, a very Gentile name. He doesn't tell people he's Jewish. But he remembers a thing of his past. Um, you know, he's a, he did some bad things when he was a kid and they still haunt him. And he gets in a panic attack. And so they have a breakthrough. He basically tells him is like, you know, you, you feel helpless and whatever. Yeah. Okay, that's number one. These just blow me away, these comics. I know you're looking at them thinking, God, how dull these look. I actually found them quite riveting. I was I was really sucked into these stories. And I don't even, uh, I'm not, I've never even gone to therapy. I, I tried once when I was like 18. I was, uh, kind of had a nervous breakdown almost. And I, I didn't get it at all. It didn't seem to do anything for me. I mean, it was my fault, but, um, I find this stuff fascinating. So now we're back to Freddie Carter. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mention the Mark Stone stories, the overweight guy. Those are written by this guy, Robert Bernstein, who, uh, created Congorilla for DC and went on to write many uh, Superman stories in the late 50s and early 60s. Okay, back to Daniel Keyes and Jack Kamen doing Freddie Carter, session two. And we find out that when he got, uh, he was he wanted to get caught for stealing the watch and he was almost bragging about it. So we have another breakthrough here where the psychiatrist says, like you wanted to hurt your parents. Because the parents are, you know, this is the 50s where they're mortified that people are going to talk about their their thief of a son and how it reflects on them. We also find out that he's kind of got hypochondriatic tendencies. And, you know, his parents, definitely his father, don't seem to love him that much. But when he's sick, you know, he gets affection, he gets attention. So he, that's another little thing he's got going on. And he convinced, he tells Freddie, you know, the, another little breakthrough. He's like, you know, this is all because you don't want to grow up. He's pretty harsh, the psychiatrist. He tells it like it is. He doesn't uh, use kid gloves. He's just like, you don't want to mature and grow up. You don't want to take responsibilities. You want to be a little kid in bed getting fed soup. You know, like, you can't do that, Freddie. You got to stop doing this uh, shit. And Freddie has another breakthrough. And oh yeah, he's a, he has asthma too, but it's fake. It was psychosomatic asthma. Cause whenever he had, whenever he was confronted with something he didn't want to deal with, he would have an asthma attack. It was subconscious, but that's why he was doing it. So now we got chapter two of Ellen Lyman, session two, I should say. And we find out more about how you know, she was terrified of her father. Her father didn't show her much love. He saved most of his affection for the older daughter that she resents. We have another dream. Oh, I'm sorry, this isn't a dream. This is a one she f almost drowned in a lake. The parents were hanging out with her sister, Ruth, and she just went off to this dock and fell in. And of course, after, you know, they treated her really good. They were like, oh, here's a doll for you, honey. We're so glad you're alive. And again, she falls down the steps later on, a staircase. So he, he lets her know, like, those weren't accidents. You did this on purpose. That was the only time you got attention. So you would conveniently have these accidents. This guy's a really good psychiatrist, man. <laughs> He's very probing. 
And also her parents just didn't seem to be in love, so she kind of blamed herself for why they hated each other. That typical thing, you know? So they have another breakthrough. And she leaves happy. She's like, I can't wait to see you next time. We gotta look into this next time. Here's another one they did. MD, Tales of Doctors. Stories of people seeking health and happiness through the grim but stirring world of real medicine. Yeah, we gotta look into that. But I mean, as you can see, it's like, this would appeal to no child at all. God, if I saw this comic when I was 10 or 12, I'd be like, ugh, that's not even a comic book. Look at all this text you gotta read. There's no superheroes, there's no action. But uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. So we're back to Mark Stone. And uh, they have another breakthrough, of course. And we find out that his mother was a totally, like, uh, you know, Jewish, European immigrant mother who just foisted food on her son. Just like, eat, eat more. And sometimes he's just like, Mom, I don't even want to eat. But she would just force him to eat. And he, so he always had a weight problem and an issue with food. He was also, we re find out that uh, he kind of was embarrassed of his mother. His mother dressed funny because, you know, she didn't really know fashion. And she had her accent and she always would talk very loud and embarrass him in front of people. So he never even realized until therapy that, you know, yeah, I, I didn't like her. I mean, I loved her, but she also embarrassed the shit out of me. And they also come through a major break breakthrough where he realizes that, uh, you know, it wasn't kind of his mother to do that. She did that for herself to make her feel better. So he shouldn't put his mom on a pedestal and feel so bad about, you know, feeling guilty about resenting her. Then we kind of have this weird interlude where he talks about how he thinks he might have killed someone on a hunting trip, never found the body. It seemed like it was all in his head. And, uh, he, of course, he's a Freudian psychiatrist, so he convinces him that you wanted to kill your father. So another great session. Uh, Mark leaves happy. He says, I'll see you next week, Doc. Thanks for the help. Psychoanalysis number three. It's got a nice dream cover. Some kind of dramatic art. Okay, Freddie Car Carter, session number three. And uh, there's this whole thing where he catches Freddie reading the sports section of the paper, and Freddie's denying it. He's like, I wasn't reading the sports, section, uh, sports section. It just opened to that page. And he's just like, totally like, okay, if you want to pretend you weren't reading the sports section, that's fine. And he's like, leave me alone about the sports section. So he brings it out of him. And uh, part of the reason why he rejects his father, pushing him into sports, is because he was an all-star, his father. He has all these trophies. He actually puts him in his son's room, supposedly as inspiration. He's like, I'm going to put all my trophies in your room so you can be inspired. Which, of course, is just really fucking narcissistic, shitty thing to do to your son. So he, he he's pretty good. He's good enough to get on the football team. But he uh, breaks his leg. And his father is such a piece of shit. He actually yells at the son. He's like, you broke your leg just to cheese me off, just to get back at me. You just don't want to do football because I love it. You don't want to do anything that would make me happy. So his father really is a tyrant. And uh, he also gives him shit, though. He, you know, he's uh, tough but fair. He says, yeah, but you seem to blame everything on your father. Every problem in your life. It does seem like his father's really bad, though. That would drive any kid to a psychoanalyst's couch. But then we talk about the mother. And we realize there's some real Freudian stuff going on. Where it's almost like Freddy subconsciously is driving his parents apart. He's putting them at odds. Because whenever his mom's really sad after a big argument, she comes to Freddy and cries. And uh, he gets to console her and be close to his mother. He also tells him that he's very afraid of the dark. And uh, he's a scared someone's going to jump out at him. And 
of course he tells him, well, you're scared of your father. But he's like, Freddy, you gotta grow up now. This is all infantile stuff that's going through your head. You're 15, you know, you gotta cut this shit out. And Freddy has a smile on his face as he leaves again. Back to session three of Ellen Lyman. And we find out that Ellen, like, has had chances for happiness. She thinks she's incredibly ugly. Look at her. I mean, she's nuts, right? She's fucking gorgeous. And she tells a story about when she was staying at her uncle's and aunt's farm one summer. She met this guy who was crazy about her. He even kissed her. She runs away, freaking out. Nobody could ever love me. I'm ugly. I'm ugly. <coughs> and she has this dream where at first she's beautiful, but then they're in a hall of mirrors with that guy, the farm boy. And he's laughing at her and he's like, you're ugly and she looks ugly. She wakes up screaming, convinced that no one could love her, no one does love her. Her uncle and aunt are like, we love you. And he's just like, see, this is just a way for you not to to push people away. You're, that guy seemed to be really into you and you ran from him. As far as he's concerned, you rejected him. And we find out that his, her sister is pretty nice. We have another story about her older sister, Ruth, that she resents. She's not this shitty, bitchy older sister. She's always trying to invite Ellen along. And Ellen's always just like, leave me alone. I don't want to do anything. I want to wallow in my self-pity. And when she goes off to get a job, she, she skips college. She thinks it's going to be different in the big city, but it's not. She doesn't warm up to anyone, and she finds out, she overhears that everyone thinks she's stuck up because of it. And I'm sure she comes across that way. So um, now she's going to night school, and this guy totally hits on her. He's like, would you go out with me? It's Peter Parker. It <laughs> looks just like Peter Parker. And, uh, and, you know, she blows him off again. She's like, no, no, I couldn't do it. Even though she regrets it this time, she's like, oh, I really like that guy, but I'm too afraid to like put my heart out there to be rejected. So they have a pretty major breakthrough and uh, she basically says, you're right. I'm not afraid anymore. You know, I'm going to call that guy up and see if the, see if he'll still take me to that concert. So the therapist just says, uh, Hey, I think we're done here. I think you're ready to uh, cope with the, your problems. You've got the necessary tools. And so it says therapy completed at the end. So I guess this was going to be the format of this comic. They just have various three, four issue story arcs for all the patients. And uh, kind of interesting. I wish this comic went on. So now we're back to Mark Stone. Uh... Mark Stone is uh, still messed up. And now we find out about his problems with women. Uh, he likes to just date. He's a gigolo. And um, he always um, basically breaks these women's hearts. After a few dates, he'll just be like, eh, I'm done with you. He's really cruel about it when he breaks up with women. And the psychiatrist kind of realizes, like, dude, it seems like you revel in it. You like it. You like these breakups. And uh, and we find out he's just really a misogynist. He's just like, ah, women, they're just like gonna suck all your money like a vampire. And uh, they just wanna take up all your time and just love is stupid, basically. I don't have any love in my life, I don't need it. So now we do a, a weird dream here where this car that kind of looks like a woman it's a very, like, beautiful car. It's chasing him, trying to kill him. He's terrified. And then when uh, it's just about to kill him, the car turns into this broken-down jalopy. So, um... He's, the dream basically represents that, you know, like, yeah, he's he's got this armor on. He's protecting himself emotionally. It's in a ritzy part of town, and um, which shows his milieu. You know, he's, he lives pretty upper middle class. 
And so the, he realizes the car is a woman. And this is what he feels, this fear of women. This is kind of interesting seeing Al Feldstein try to do like, almost like German expressionistic sets in those old silent movies. Everything's all wonky and crazy because it's in a dream. Because usually Al Feldstein just drew like a, like a Swiss watch. You know, everything was very square and uh, normal. So that's kind of interesting seeing him try something new. Yeah, Mark says, yeah, the car is a woman. I get it now. So he feels like, yeah, you feel like women will trap you. And uh, you'll never get to be, you know, a pure writer. You'll be stuck with the nine to five grind of uh, writing for the paycheck. And he also has some revelations about his mom. It's like, yeah, she really didn't care about me sometimes. So Mark has another breakthrough. He's pretty happy. And here we got the last issue, number four. Once again, a very dull cover. <laughs> no kid in the 50s wanted to pick this comic up. Okay, here we have Freddie Carter again. And the parents show up with Freddie Carter. And they're like, basically say, you know, his grades are still terrible at school. This isn't working at all. Uh, we're taking him out of therapy. And the psychiatrist makes a case. He's like, look at all these things that have changed in Freddie's life. He doesn't steal anymore. He doesn't have his um, asthma attacks, his psychosomatic illnesses anymore. And he basically gives them the business. He's like, you guys need therapy. You guys are totally the reason why Freddie's such a mess. I mean, he's told me all this stuff. And so he goes into the office to talk to Freddie. He's like, well, let me just talk to him. So you're here. I'm just going to talk to him one more time. And uh, once again, talking about how the father's just browbeating him. He says, if you don't pass your exams, I'm going to beat you within an inch of your life. Like, he's really a shitty dad. But, you know, all Freddie wants, to, uh, all he wants to do is read, like, he loves reading, like, novels and history. That's where his strength lies. He's just not a math guy, math science guy. The father won't accept it. He's disgusted that his son wants to read novels. He's just ridiculous. Of course, the parents still fighting all the time about this. And this is when he says, I'm through with Freddy's analysis. And uh, now, now begins yours. I'm going to give you a phone number for a colleague. You guys need therapy. And surprisingly, it works. <laughs> he convinces them that, yeah, maybe we do which I really doubt would happen in real life. Yeah, so um, he, he gives the father his critique of him and like, you're a tyrant and the wife loves it. She's like, see, I told you, you're a neurotic. And then he turns to her and says, oh, wait a second. You're just as bad in a different way. And he's like, good, tell her. So then he's like, I'm telling you both, you're both fucked up and you're fucking up Freddie and you need therapy. And they agree. So they walk off with a hopeful, hopeful future. But uh, he's content that Freddy, uh, you know, gets, gets shit now and he'll be okay. So the therapy's completed. So now this chapter has two Mark Stones because uh, Ellen's not around anymore. And I, I, they probably figured this was the last issue they knew. So they wanted to wrap up Mark Stone and didn't want to introduce a new patient. So his therapy really seems to be working. Mark has lost all this weight. He's not uh, eating anymore to compensate for his uh, feelings of being less than and trying to hurt himself. He doesn't feel the need to hurt himself. But uh, he seems very resentful at the psychiatrist because the psychiatrist we find out was going on vacation. So he's almost become addicted to his therapy because he does know that it's working. But he's kind of giving him shit. He's like, you know, you're, oh, you're just talk to me because you get paid for it. You wouldn't even give a shit if I wasn't paying you. And he's like, well, yeah, that's my job, Mark. <laughs> that, yeah, that's what I do. Where's this hostility coming from? So we find out it's because he's going on vacation, the psychiatrist. He won't be able to see him for a few weeks. And he's kind of wigging out. Mark is wigging. He's 
shit, what am I going to do without therapy? Because it's really helped him. So we have a reminiscence of his father. And um, I'm sorry, this is a dream, he has, where the psychiatrist is uh, browbeating the son. But then the psychiatrist, I'm sorry, he's browbeating Mark, but the psychiatrist turns into his father. So obviously he's equating the psychiatrist with his father. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he talks, talks about this other dream where he's a little boy and his parents just leave for Bermuda without him. And they leave some food. And uh, it's a horrifying dream. He's been abandoned. And uh, he talks to him. as like, you just want to destroy me right now because I'm your father figure. Transferal, I guess they call it. So he says, this is normal. This happens. You know, sometimes you get a rapport with your therapist and it feels deeper than it is. But really, I'm just here to help you. I'm like a doctor, you know. So Mark comes in one day. This is a final session. And he seems terrible. And it seems like he's had a a relapse we had a really bad couple weeks he has a panic attack again he hasn't had him in a while and he has to get on a plane he's convinced the plane's gonna crash he, he, even getting into an elevator he thinks the elevator is gonna malfunction and you know he's gonna plummet to his death all of a sudden, he's terrified of certain things that he never was before. And, of course, the psychiatrist explains it to him. He said, remember a few months ago, we talked about how your analysis is coming to an end. You've made all this great uh, progress. You probably won't need me in a f after a few sessions. So to him, to Mark, this is like a death sentence. You know, he was on his way to an early grave when he first started coming here for therapy. And this guy has helped him so much that his life has gotten so much better that now he is, uh, you know, he's terrified. So that's why he's having all these dreams and uh, fears about dying. Because he almost feels like his end of therapy will be that. But he has obviously made strides. So he tells them, he says, you know, like um, I met this one of the girls I've been dating. She's the one. I bought her a ring and she turned me down. And she says, you know, Mark, I'm attracted to you, but you know, it just, we've never even spoke of marriage. This seems a little weird. Let's just see what happens. Let's give it some time. He becomes very jealous. It basically pushes her away. And the doctor tells him that, you know, you're, you're so desperate because our time is ending. I've been your emotional crutch in a way that you were desperately seeking like a wife. Someone who'd be your new emotional support. And even though the time wasn't right, you just convince yourself that you had to marry this woman and she could sense that, you know, she, she could sense how weird it is. So Mark realizes, yeah, that makes sense, doc. And he says, yeah, this is our last session. You're good. Just, uh, just realize that you don't need me anymore and you're going to be fine. Stop being all afraid. So that's it for psychoanalysis number one through four some uh i don't know how many of you out there would like this stuff <laughs> I, I really enjoyed it but i just can't believe how dull it is like you know we look at a lot of artists on this channel and you you look at a lot of comic artists and you know it's nice seeing great imaginative dynamic art great storytelling this is just panel after panel of talking heads and yet uh i found it quite fascinating and just the fact that it came out in 1955. Truly adult comics, being made for adults. And uh, obviously it didn't last. Uh, the world wasn't ready yet. But I wonder if this comic came out today, if it would find a place in the market now. I don't think it would either. It's just a very weird idea. But that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. And 
I'll see you next time at the Pedagogian Institute of Comic Book Studies.